Yeah. <laughs> Grinning like a little, little fool. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. It's wonderful to be back together. Let's stand, get to your feet, get that blood flowing. We are here to sing his praises, and he is more than worthy. So wherever you are right now with all the ups and downs, the successes, the stresses of this week, give it all to God this morning in praise. Free from judgment and connect with him today. Hear from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So join us as we repeat these truths in song together. I waited for the Lord At last he looked and He bent down and pulled me out Oh, of deep, deep mud and He stood me up on solid ground Made this weak heart strong he gave me a song to sing whoa it's rising now whoa it's rising now i've got this new song in my mouth can you hear it now it's pouring it's pouring out of my new life i am found can you here and now it's pouring it's pouring out and he taught me how to sing this rescue song for everyone is lost and lonely it's rising now whoa it's rising now i've got this new song in my mouth can you hear it now it's pouring it's pouring out of my new life i'm found can you here and now it's pouring, it's pouring out. I got this new song in my mouth. Can you hear it now? It's pouring, it's pouring out of my new life. I am found. Can you hear it now? It's pouring, it's pouring out. And it goes oh, 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 and it goes oh, 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 and it goes oh, oh. In our mouths, can you hear it now? It's pouring, it's pouring out of our new lives. We 
we are found in you here and now it's pouring it's pouring out we've got this new song in our mouths can you hear it now it's pouring it's pouring out of our new lives we are found can you hear it now it's pouring it's pouring next song guys is called uh, there is one gospel and it's a newer song full of powerful truth and doctrine in regards to the gospel it's very hymn like and uh, a little bit easier of a melody to follow and we introduced it about two weeks ago when we were with, without electricity and so uh, if you remember it it may have been a little bit hard to hear uh, but today we've got that power again here so uh, but sing along if you're able and just let those words and truths within wash over you and take comfort in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning.
of sin this morning comes from Romans. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is greater than all our sin The sin despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss grace that is greater yes grace untold points to the refuge the mighty cross grace grace God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is greater than all our sin Dark is the stain that we cannot hide what can avail to wash it away look there is flowing a crimson tide whiter than snow you may be today grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You that are longing to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is greater than all our sin Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Oh, grace, 
grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise as we were created to do this morning. As we sing and meditate on the lyrics and truths from your scriptures today, we thank you for the gospel. The life-changing power that guides us, saves us from our sins and the consequences of death, placed upon your son Jesus who, while fully blameless, took our punishment upon him. That's why we are here to live a life worthy that you've called us to. Through your Holy Spirit and through our community, hold us accountable and soften our hearts as we hear from your servant, Joey, this morning. May we grow closer and closer to you. In your name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to introduce myself. I think I've met many of you. Um, my name is Joey Fink. I serve as the executive pastor here. I think I just finished my fifth week. Um, if you are a guest, we're also glad uh, that you are here. Good to meet you. Please make sure you would fill out one of those welcome cards on the seat in front of you. Um, I want to thank Pastor Eric for the opportunity to preach this morning. Uh, my first sermon here, which I think coincidentally he timed with March Madness. So... <laughs> Uh, he wanted to make sure that he had some time off this week. Uh, but it is an honor uh, to pick up where he left off last week as we look, uh, as he shared of gospel uh, doctrine. And then this morning I'll be sharing about gospel uh, culture in hopes that that leads us towards next week of understanding gospel power. So let me uh, pray for us and then we'll get to work. Father, would you bless this time now? Would you use your word? Would you make it come alive to us? Would you use it to shape us into the image of Jesus? Father, would we have open hands to receive uh, what you have for us this morning, that we would uh, equally praise you and receive what you have? Uh, Father, we thank you and pray your blessing on our church in this time now. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, first I want to start with this. We talked about gospel doctrine, and this week I want to make a suggestion that correct gospel doctrine creates gospel culture. Uh, gospel doctrine is the hearing of the gospel, and gospel culture is the doing of the gospel. And those two coming together to make a powerful experience in the gospel. Francis Schaeffer spoke once of orthodoxy of, of doctrine and orthodoxy of community being together significant. Well, you may not understand what the word orthodoxy means. Uh, have any of you been to an orthodentist before? I don't enjoy going to the dentist. It's always expensive, painful, and I get a lecture. And so I hope that you uh, have better experience when you go than I do. But the word orthodontist, uh, the word ortho is very simple. It just means straight. Dentist means having to do with teeth. So when you go to the orthodontist, you get straight teeth. Pretty simple, right? When you understand orthodoxy, uh, doxa is this idea of belief. So straight, so orthodoxa, so straight beliefs. Uh, there's also another term, um, orthopraxy. So orthopraxy is straight practice. So we understand of orthodoxy, straight belief, leads to straight uh, practice. And so as we talk about the gospel culture, it's almost that very idea. Um, it means to pursue uh, not only what we believe, but what we practice. Um, it's interesting, we live in a day and an age where what we believe becomes more important than ever. We should understand what we believe. There's a lot of things competing for our allegiance. There's a lot of things complete, competing for uh, our worship even. 
And have you ever heard the term your truth? The idea of your truth, what's interesting, uh, many decades ago, the idea of uh, Francis Schaeffer, this, uh, he saw this coming, where people would start, I want to realize my truth, or I want to be my truth. And as Christians, we should resist that idea entirely. Um, he said, uh, well, what I'm looking for is the true truth, the understanding that there is one truth. And that there is no other substitute that will do the trick. Uh, so this orthodoxy, the straight um, belief and the orthopraxy, uh, one cannot explain the explosion of the early church apart from the fact that it practiced two things simultaneously. Orthodoxy, the doctrine, and, ortho, um, and the orthodoxy of community. In the midst of the visible church, a community which the world would see by the grace of God, therefore the church must be known simultaneously for its purity of doctrine and its reality of community. Our churches have so often been only preaching points with very little emphasis on community. But the exhibition of the love of God in practice is beautiful and must be there. So right belief should lead to right practice. What a church says and what a church does. Uh, Sam Alberry, uh, he uh, made a term that I just really connected with when he was trying to describe what was experienced in the church it says there shouldn't be a difference or a disconnect between the grace of Jesus that we receive in the gospel and what we experience in church life. And yet so often there is. And he described this as a gospel insanity. That what we experience in the grace of the gospel should also be our experience when we encounter the church when we encounter the people of God coming together, that they would experience that same grace in practice. And when you don't, there's something in you that says, this is crazy. That's the gospel insanity. That the people of God and the, and, and the grace of God found in the gospel should be one and the same. And that's even given the church or the people of God a bad reputation at times. That they'd say that there's a hypocrisy that exists from what God says and what people do. And we understand that differently. We understand the grace of God and that we are broken people, but it is in our brokenness that we point to the gospel yet again. And so the, even that is a picture of what should be in our practice. A church can also unsay by its culture what it has said in its doctrine. You with me? A church can unsay what it has said in its doctrine if it doesn't practice it. It can basically, you lose your ability uh, to make that point when people stop listening. They say, I don't believe you. I don't see it. I don't experience it. Um, but the church should be something much different. Um, I, when I was a kid growing up, we went to my great-grandmother's ha house. She's was a saint, loved Jesus. She's with the Lord now for many years. But um, we, at my great-grandmother's house, she had a front living room that we were not allowed to go in. Did anybody else grow up with this? As though like the president was coming over later that afternoon or something like that. There was this one room and everything was perfect. And not uh, only was this room perfect, but in uh, this living room, there was a glass display cabinet. Did y'all's grandmother have this? And in that seemed to be the crown jewels. I, 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 I mean, it was filled up with things that you dare not touch and you're not even sure you're allowed to look at. But there was this glass display case and in it were these treasures um, that were obviously breakable and, and not suited for the hands of a young boy. I wasn't much, very only a few times a year allowed to go into the room, but I certainly was never allowed to open up that display case. Well, the church should be a display case for the world that when they look into it, they see the treasures of the gospel. And the neatest thing is they can enter in and participate. 
It, it should not only be something that they see and hear, but something they experience. So as we look to the idea of a gospel culture, we first need to define it, right? Um, we talked very much about gospel doctrine and, and, and what that means, but it may be a little bit harder to describe, but I would say even harder to uh, create is a gospel culture that flows from gospel doctrine. Ray Ortland gives a definition, and it's a bit lengthy. I'm going to give a shortened one after. But it says this, The shared experience of grace for the undeserving, the corporate incarnation of the biblical message. In the relationships, the vibe, the feel, the tone, the values, the priorities, the aroma, the honesty, the freedom, gentleness, humility, and cheerfulness. Indeed, the total human reality of a church defined and sweetened by the gospel. So I reduced that down to say this. A gospel culture is one where the gospel saturates everything. The gospel saturates everything. It saturates our hallways. It saturates our kids' classrooms. It, it saturates the pulpit. It saturates the pews. And it also saturates our homes and our marriages and our uh, comings and goings. That when a gospel people go forward, they go so with the gospel. They do it as they live. They do it as they talk as they walk along the road and as they lie down and as they, they wake up. The gospel culture is one where the gospel saturates everything. I saw an illustration, and I want to share it with you now, about how we can properly understand the gospel. And uh, this comes from uh, Trevin Wax. He, he uh, puts together, to properly understand the gospel, you've got to see it as this three-legged stool in order to sit on it. The first is you hear and understand the gospel story. You have to see yourself and your place in the grand story that is unfolding. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man and everything that was in it. And from there, we fast forward very quickly to Genesis chapter 3, where everything falls apart, right? The sinfulness of man comes on. Uh, we know the story very true in our own hearts and lives. And, and I can step by step work our way all the way from the flood uh, through the, the Ten Commandments and, and the covenants that were made and the, and the prophets. And we work our way to Jesus. There's a famous sermon. I encourage you to go uh, listen to it sometime, but it's talk about the scarlet red, um, the scarlet thread of redemption. And W.A. Criswell uh, preached that sermon, but he went uh, for four hours straight showing uh, the story and the message of the great narrative of scripture all the way from Genesis to Revelation. But we have to see ourselves now to a place where Jesus comes on the scene and he comes to redeem us through his work on the cross, through the glorious resurrection. He ascended into heaven, is now seated, declaring the work on the cross is finished and we await the return of our Savior, the consummation of the kingdom. And as we see ourselves in that great story that unfolds, the gospel takes hold. Then we must come to the place of the gospel announcement. And the gospel announcement is that we must believe. That you must receive the gospel. That you, may, you have to respond to the gospel of understanding. And I don't make an assumption that, that you've done so this morning. I want to give you an opportunity. That if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, that today you would do so. You would understand your place in the great story, the great narrative that you have experienced the brokenness of sin and you will never experience satisfying uh, in anything except in the complete, full, finished work of Jesus. And so I want you to believe. I plead with you to trust Christ, to repent of your sin, to receive and understand what he did standing on our behalf on the cross and his defeating of sin, Satan, and death and the glorious resurrection and that new life that is available. 
So we have to each in our own moment come to a place of owning and believing. And that is the gospel announcement. And I hope that you do so this morning if you have not previously. But if you have, you still need to be reminded of the gospel this day and to receive it and to um, tell it to yourself again and to one another. Lastly, and here's why I bring this this, uh, illustration to us this morning, is gospel story, gospel announcement, but gospel community. He sees gospel community as essential for understanding the gospel. And oftentimes, we don't see that as part of the package, as part of the picture. Um, If you remove gospel community from your thinking about the gospel announcement, you put the gospel of its purpose. You remove the gospel of its purpose. Though the church is... uh, Though the church is not the subject of the gospel announcement, Christ alone is the subject. The church is the necessary object. Christ's death has a purpose, to save sinners and incorporate them into a community that reflects his glory. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says this, He gave himself to us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. Let me read this for you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You hear that same theme. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. So you see, God in the gospel, never saw these things as step one and step two, but, or step one and then optional. But the gospel has always been for God to create a people of his own possession. So you don't go to church, you are the church. And that you are a people, you were once not a people, but now you are a people, of God's possession for his purpose, for his plan, for his glory, for our good. And that we have to see ourselves in that. The purpose of Christ's work is that in union with him, we would be reconciled to the Father and adopted into his family. Now think of it this way. Saying the good news is limited to the gospel announcement is like saying the good news that the, the adoption papers have been signed without a view of the purpose of the papers is to incorporate an orphan into the family. So understand the gospel saving work was to bring you into the family of God for all its benefits and all of its purpose. A few months back, I uh, had to buy a new truck, uh, which is always painful to buy a new vehicle. Uh, It's particularly painful to do so during uh, post-COVID months and and years now. And uh, but it's amazing when you buy a vehicle, you begin to see it everywhere. You know what I'm talking about? So I had to order a truck because none were available and went and found one that worked with the budget and things like that. And it took nearly eight months to uh, to receive it. And as that uh, went on, I was still driving my 18 year old truck that's falling apart. But every time I would see them all over town now, the one I ordered, they, I'd see it at every uh, traffic light or I'd see it passing me going down the road. And I'm like, oh, that one's my color. They were, I mean, it's amazing how you begin to now see that in every place and every way. 
Well, it's the same uh, when you look to Scripture and you become aware of the fact that everything that's in the Gospel is also supposed to be viewed through the lens of us being a church and a people and a community of God's possession. And then you go back and read Scripture to, in, in different ways and all of a sudden you see it. There it is. Again and again and again. And it was never meant to be unhinged. But the idea is that a Gospel culture is the right doctrine and the right practice, which is the gospel community. And, and when we own that and receive that, in order to fully experience a gospel culture, we must realize our gospel identity. We must realize our gospel identity. We seem in this world to think that our works determine who we are. I study this. I work here. It makes me this. I do these things. Uh, you do not earn entrance into the church. You're already the church. The moment you believe in Christ, you're already the church. You're not a missionary because you do mission. You do mission because you already have an identity as a missionary. You see that uh, shown there in, in, um, in 1 Peter, that we are to proclaim the excellencies that we experienced in Christ. So we must receive that identity as the church and as missionaries in order to experience a gospel culture. So I want to transition from here, kind of a long, um, a long conclusion where I want to look at Romans chapter 15. We've defined a bit what a gospel culture is, and now we need to, uh, to talk through what are the markers of a gospel culture, what cultivates a gospel culture. And let me read uh, for you Romans chapter 15, and then we're going to extract a few points uh, from here. So starting in verse 4, For everything that was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you harmony with one another in Christ Jesus so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God the Father our Lord Jesus Christ the servant of the Jews and Gentiles Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring glory to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. So from even reading this scripture in the lens of a gospel culture and a gospel people, I think we can come up with a few markers here together of what a gospel culture uh, is. First, it's built on gospel doctrine. Verse 4 there says, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, and through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So the idea of the things that were written before, those are the, the, the orthodoxy. Those are uh, the idea of straight beliefs. Uh, the understanding uh, that we have these things we know to be true and we believe them. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1 says this, He upholds and sustains the universe by the word of His power. So we have the word of God. We have the word which is Jesus. And it is through being founded on good gospel doctrine that comes from the word of God. That is the first uh, marker of a gospel culture. The second marker is this, that we must be centered on the hope of the gospel and a shared grace and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Again, from earlier, the church and a gospel culture should be synonymous. The church should have a felt sense of the grace of God. So in, in verse 4, 
through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Proclaim the gospel to one another. Proclaim the gospel to one another. Make gospel talk normal among you. Tim Chester, a, um, I guess I'll just say a, a missiologist, said this, that we should be gospeling one another. That we should be gospeling one another. And what he meant by that was the idea that every day we should be preaching the gospel to one another. We should be preaching the gospel to ourselves and we should be preaching the gospel to one another. And when we do that, something amazing happens. One, we're reminded of the truths that we have and the hope that exists in Christ. Secondly, when you preach the gospel every day to yourself and you preach the gospel every day to other believers, it's great practice for preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world. You get good at it. You remind yourself every day of the gospel. You talk about it with those around you in the church, other believers. And if you do that every day, it should feel very comfortable then to go forward and share the gospel, oftentimes where we feel intimidated. But if you practice sharing the gospel to yourself every day and to other believers, you'll be prepared to give an answer for anyone who asks for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. What does it look like to stir up one another? To have a gospel culture that's centered around the grace of God. That we're going to stir each other up. That when I get with you and two people that love Jesus are, get together and talk about what God is doing in our lives, it stirs us up. You know the other things you're passionate about. It's amazing how you come alive when you find a friend that has the same hobbies or passions that you do. And you get excited to talk about sports or you get excited to talk about uh, whatever activities that you love. You get stirred up. You get excited. And that's what it means to stir up one another. When you start talking about Jesus, you get excited. It stirs up your love and affection for him. The primary and essential truth of understanding and experiencing a gospel culture must begin not with collectively how good we are. Rather, it must begin with a clear understanding and embracing of who we are. We must begin with our equal brokenness and our complete need for Jesus, our total need for the gospel and keen understanding and awareness of our sinfulness. So if you want to get to a gospel culture, it's not going to be because we all achieved it together. It's going to be because we got together and acknowledged our need for Jesus, which also walks us into a place of vulnerability, of our brokenness, of our sin, of our daily needing of the gospel. But if you get the people of God together talking about their brokenness, it endears one another, but then you get reminded of the gospel. And all of that points to Jesus. When you get together and talk about how good you are, who does that point to? They point to you. When you get together and you talk about your brokenness and how Christ has redeemed you, that points to him. That is stirring up one another. We need to be people centered around the gospel. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. From 1 Peter chapter 2 that we read earlier. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's saying that something changed. And something changed in you so drastic that once you were not a people, when you received the mercy of God, you're now a people. And so let's get together and talk about the mercy we have received. Because that stirs up our affection and worship and stirs us up to good works. Next a characteristic or a marker of gospel culture. 
It, it models life-giving, idol-destroying, authentic biblical community. I feel like I wanted to keep adding commas and more adjectives because the gospel does so many things in and through us. Verse 15 here, or I'm sorry, uh, chapter 15, verse 5 and 7. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. See, again, we're looking to the scriptures, seeing that God designed us as his people to live in harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we were designed to be in community. We are designed to not go to church, but to be the church. But here's the trick. We should not seek community. We are already God's people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said that we, that we have made community uh, in the gospel. The person who loves the dream of community will destroy community. Listen, you don't get by com community by pursuing community. You know how you get community? By pursuing Jesus together and living on mission together. You'll get the best community you'll ever experience in your life. When you both pursue Jesus together and you both pursue purpose and mission together, you'll receive it. But if you just want to get together for community, that again becomes a consumer understanding of what community is. Let's get together and see what I can get out of it. No, let's get together and let's point and fix our eyes on Jesus and run towards that end and what purposes, where he's called us to serve and where he's called us to go and to communicate who he is. You know, one of the, uh, the, the great X factors in, in small groups is the idea of coming together and sharing our stories. I love this because what it does is uh, people... Uh, when they share their hurts, their struggles, their needs, it points a picture to Jesus, but it also allows other people to share the gospel with us. And when we do that in our groups, it's amazing how that endears us to one another. It's amazing how at that point you now start to do life with that person and you understand their story and you understand what God has done in their life. And you uh, now begin to run the race together. But it's oftentimes in our weakness that the gospel strength or gospel power, as we will talk about, shines the brightest. If we act as if we can do it, if we act as though we know it, if we act as though we have it, if we act as though we can make it, again, it becomes all about you. But if we come together and we say, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And we preach the gospel to one another. It creates a gospel culture. That gospel culture is anti-idol. It's also, I would even go further as to say, that it is a process by which God uses to destroy idols in our own life. One of the most intimate things that a gospel culture can do is give the license to someone else to help destroy the idols that exist in your life. You hear me? The idea that in your community group or in this church, you give a brother or sister a hammer and you have a hand, hammer in your hand and you say, I'm asking you to help destroy the idols that exist in my life. Would you help me? Would you help me pursue righteousness? Would you help, help me pursue holy living? And in that, you're asking someone else to help you put together the sin that exists in you. That's a very intimate thing. There was a, a story that Ray Ortland shared about early on in his church. He had a group of about 30 men that got together for a men's study. And uh, I don't know if he didn't prepare that night or he uh, felt the Spirit's leading. But that night he said, all right, guys, here's what I want you to do. Uh, we're just going to get together in groups of two, so one-on-one. -on -one. And what I want you to do is I want you to share your biggest weakness and your biggest uh, struggles and temptations with one another. 
Uh, he also said, I don't really advise this. Uh, but he said, and then after you're done, I just want you to spend some time praying for one another. And he looks back over the many years following that church, and, and it grew, and God used it, and many people stepped up into leadership, and he traced it back to that night. He said, that was the night that shaped our church. Because at that night, people shared their need for Jesus. And then they prayed for one another. And then they entered in to that person's story in life. That is a gospel culture. So right now, everybody, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but as we do that, we preach the gospel to ourselves. And we preach our, the gospel to one another. What does it look like for us to outdo one another in showing honor? To radically do life together. To change our schedules and rhythms. Uh, the, uh, to ask others to enter into our lives. To create margin. Each of these could be a sermon unto itself. How we can serve and love others in the church with our resources and our time. The fourth uh, marker of a gospel culture is that it practices hospitality. So verse 7 here in Romans chapter 15 says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We welcome people into the gospel culture. You understand? We welcome them into the gospel culture. That is an act of hospitality. That is a warm and inviting place where they can experience the grace of God. Hopefully a consistent grace of God. The same grace of God that we know to be true in the way God reveals himself to us. And hopefully a gospel community, a gospel culture that is the same experience of the grace of God. And that has a profound effect. That has a, an effect that people want and are drawn towards it. The last and final point of a, the markers of a gospel culture that, is that they participate together in a shared purpose and mission. You hear that? A gospel people in creating a gospel culture share together in God's purpose and mission. Verse 8, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to show God's trustfulness in order to confirm the promises given from the patriarchs and in, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As I can go into an in-depth study here, but basically the Gentiles here are described as those who are not God's people can now become God's people. That he is sending God's people to people who are not God's people to make them God's people. And that's the same thing, the idea that we're being sent, uh, that it said in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we read earlier, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Gospel culture is rooted in the sending nature of God, that an essential part of a gospel culture is a missional culture. The more that the church sees itself as a people and not a place, the more it will realize its purpose and its mission. This is gospel culture. Our capacity to reach the world with the message of Jesus is the same of that of the church in the book of Acts. But it requires a new way of community and life in the gospel. That we must dedicate ourselves to gospel truth, gospel doctrine. And we must dedicate ourselves equally to gospel culture and gospel community to experience, as we'll look at next week, gospel power. Let me end with this quote. We accept that the truth of biblical doctrine is essential to authentic Christian community. But do we accept that the beauty of the human relationships that exist within the church is equally essential? If by God's grace we hold the two together, gospel doctrine and gospel culture, people of all ages 
will likely come to our churches with great joy. It is more likely that they will think, here is the answer that I've been looking for my whole life. Let us pray. Father, as we think of a gospel culture, we just think of the gospel. We think of the life and the love that we have experienced in Jesus, the forgiveness and redemption that we have experienced. That once we were not your people, but we experienced mercy and it changed everything. Father, allow us to preach the gospel to ourselves. Allow us to preach the gospel to one another, to other believers. And help us to become good at practicing it so much that we preach the gospel with the world. Father, I pray that our church would be a consistent church. Gospel consistent. That we would hold fast to gospel doctrine. And hold fast to our identity as your chosen people. in creating a gospel culture. We're just like my grandmother's glass cabinet. You would look inside our church and as people do, they would experience and see the treasures, the truth of a gospel culture being lived out. And Father, we pray that many would come to trust you and that we would be reminded as we encourage one another in the gospel. We thank you for your love for us and your plan and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand and sing? All these pieces broken and scattered In mercy gathered, mended and whole Empty-handed but not forsaken I've been set free Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. I can see you now Oh, I can see the love in your eyes Laying yourself down Raising up the broken to
of pardon this morning comes from 2 Corinthians. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are, a God of perfect love, a God who perfectly models what it means to have perfect gospel doctrine and gospel culture. You sent that example to us in Jesus, who died for us in the ultimate act of love for us to follow. And God, as we proclaim to love you, we proclaim to love the Jesus that died for us. Help us to love others the same way. Help us to learn from you and from each other what it means to have both perfect gospel doctrine and gospel culture. That way we can be a better representation of Jesus to those around us and model why they need the same relationship that we have with you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Josh. You guys can have a seat. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome. In case I haven't met you yet, my name is Eric Colser. I serve as uh, another pastor here at Gospel Collective Church. Uh, Joey, thank you so much for, again, sharing God's Word. Um, I knew you were the right person to explain what gospel culture is, and especially in its relation to gospel community. And I promise, church, that is the reason why he was teaching today, although my colors probably shows elsewise. Uh, yes, I have been paying attention to the tournament, but as many of you guys know, I am a Buckeye, so this is just me being a good missionary uh, to you and with you, okay? So, I, of course, class for that one. Uh, but just like I'm trying to be a good missionary with you as well, um, I'm going to ask for you to be a good missionary with us, uh, and that is through our Easter services right here. Many of you guys see the cards on the table. There's also, I mean, on the seats, there's also some on the tables in the back. Um, many of you know and you've heard Easter weekend and Christmas weekend um, are large weekends in the life of not only our church, but a lot of churches, and especially in areas like Lexington, Kentucky, where many have grown up in church, have a little bit of culture of that, uh, uh, upbringing, background to that, and uh, they may not be in church anymore. Uh, they may have never, ever truly believed in that way. And some of the very people that maybe are on your prayer cards from last month uh, when it comes to reaching your Jerusalem, um, and you guys turn those, and you've been praying for them in the midst of the community group, some of those very people may be people that will come to Easter service. And so I want you to take these cards. Again, they're in your seats. There's some extras in the back. Uh, look at them. Uh, put it on your calendar. Pray for some of the people that you can be able to invite to the services. Remember, that's a busy weekend. We have three exciting things. First off, Good Friday service. We'll be partaking in Lord's Supper. We'll have a presentation of the cross. Um, we'll be singing songs and hearing a message about the atonement. Child care will be for five and under, but it's especially great service as we, again, celebrate uh, uh, what he did on the cross together and focus on that and remember that in the Lord's Supper as well. So that's going to be on Friday at 6.30 p.m. Then
The next day is our Easter egg hunt. That's 10 a.m. for all of our families. Um, if you can be able to help out with that, contact Kendra or Tiffany, and they can kind of share with you next steps with that. Um, we're going to be presenting the gospel there. It's going to be a fun, great time with kids. We do need your help with that. We need your help when it comes to, one, uh, uh, just getting the word out, inviting other families maybe in your neighborhood, families that you know, but then also what we need your help. You may remember this from last year. You did a great job. We thank you for this. We're going to ask you to do the same this year. You see in the back um, table right there, there are these bags of Easter eggs right here. We're asking for you to be able to take these eggs, to fill them up with candy, and be able to bring them back to uh, Kendra. Um, if maybe you can't partake in that yourself. Maybe, again, you don't have kids that age, um, and that's a, a busy day for you, but you can be able to help serve us by helping us out, grabbing one of these bags, filling it up with candy, and bring it back to Kendra. And so there's about 10 bags left, 11 counting this one. Who's someone that's going to grab that bag so I can toss this to you right now? Who would do that? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So now, t officially, 10 bags. Just bring them back to Kendra, um, and we really do appreciate that. And then, of course, the next day is Easter Sunday. And as I'd mentioned, what a glorious day for us to do what we do each Sunday, make it all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but celebrate specifically the resurrection, and the gospel is going to be clear. There's going to be an invitation, and we ask for you to invite. We also are going to be having baptisms that day. And so for some of you, that is your next step in obedience to the Lord. And listen, church, what greater day to celebrate the new life in you than the day we focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if that's you, you can fill that out again on this card right here. Um, uh, just put interested baptism. We'd love to talk to you about that. We're excited to celebrate that. And we also need help with that as well. So some of you guys may remember this, especially if you were with us in the very beginning, like eight, nine years ago, when we set up and tore down in Garden Springs Elementary School, um, we had door hanger days. How many guys were a part of that those first few years? Just put your hands up. Okay. Wow. That is so little, okay? That's okay because it's going to be a lot now, all right? We haven't done this since we moved into this neighborhood and into this building that God graciously gifted to us. And so since we've been here, we have not done any door hangers, and we want to be able to invite our neighbors to the Easter egg hunt, to Easter celebration on that day. And so on Sunday April, I think it's third, okay? From 2 to 5 p.m., we are going to have second. Thank you very much. April 2nd, from 2 to 5 p.m., we're going to go door hangers, all right? It's just going to be two to three hours, just the neighborhood right around here. Um, we're going to ask you to be able to do that. We'll have sign-ups for that over the next couple of weeks just so we can be able to get an estimate of people so we can draw out those maps. And what we're going to be doing is uh, hanging up door hangers, just inviting them to Easter egg service. Now, um, if you can't be able to hang, uh, if you can't be able to help out with that, actually, I think every one of our cards got taken. Joey, is that correct? Do you see rubber bands? Do you see any of those things? Oh, I love you guys. Well, I love the 915 service more than you, okay? I'll love you if you get the Easter eggs, okay? Never mind. 915 took all these. So they're going to be uh, uh, creating the rubber bands, uh, I mean, the uh, door hangers for this. So you don't have to worry about that. That is gone, Joey. Is that correct? Perfect. Okay. Never mind about that. Sign up for day door hangers the next few weeks with that. So that's a big weekend, but oh, what an important weekend, especially when it comes to getting the gospel out in those ways. Um, a last thing about that, you heard this last week, we do also have spring cleaning that's coming up this upcoming Saturday. Um, it's going to be nine to one. Lunch will be provided. We ask for you to sign up just so we know about how many will be here so we can not only provide for lunch, but then also what jobs we want to take care of. Many of you guys saw from the windstorm, we still have all those branches out in the front there. There's some spring clean we want to do both outside and inside. Depending on how many people are here, we'll make sure it's the right amount of work for the right amount of people. If you can help out with that, families, kids, you are invited um, with families. A lot of times we'll have some outside work and kids can be able to hang out in the playground and be able to help out with some of the things as well. So again, that's next Saturday. There are signups. It's to the left of the Glorify God sign. I think um, you'll see them, the sign-up sheet over there. So if you can be able to help out with that, that would be a great help. Last three things. Um, coming up the first Thursday after Easter is something called Institutes. Um, if you've been around the last few years, you know we just take four days, four, four days, uh, four weeks to be able to go a little bit deeper with stuff that we cannot maybe cover in both community groups and Sunday morning. And so this upcoming Institutes is going to be the most influential Christian fiction books. Uh, they're on sale in the back. You guys see them. doesn't have price, but you're more than welcome to grab one, Venmo it, give us cash or check. They're $10. Each one of those books are $10. It's these four books, The Divine Comedy by Dante, Paradise Lost by John Milton, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, and The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. We're not expecting you to read 
read those before we start this. You're more than welcome to start reading some of those. My hope and prayer is that as you learn about these, it's going to influence you to read them. And listen, church, let me briefly share with you why these books are important. Even if you're not a reader, it would be good for you to attend this so you know the impact and influence of these books. For example, Divine Comedy, written in 1320 AD, um, that book has been called one of the essential books of mankind. As Dante talks kind of like a semi-autobiographical poetic tale of what it looks like to journey for self-knowledge and ultimately salvation. Listen, that book has influenced for centuries what many Christians believe about the afterlife and what many unbelievers stereotype about Christianity as one of the most translated books in the world. And listen, some of the things that come from this is not even biblically accurate, but people stereotype about the afterlife about it and from it. And so you're going to want to hear know why. And listen, even if it's just you buying it, it looks really good on your bookshelf, okay? People are going to say, wow, Divine Comedy, nice, okay? So even if it's just getting it for there, but it is a very influential book you want to hear about. Paradise Lost, John Milton, written in 1667, one of the greatest epic poems in the English language. And similar to Divine Comedy, um, it has been used, and people have think have thought about not only Satan's account, the rebellion, but the fall because of it, that some of those aren't even biblical pictures. And so you want to hear why it has been so influential? Both C.S. Lewis and the author of his dark materials, Philip Pullman, has been greatly influenced by its writing style of fiction because of that book. It has also caused much debate over modern-day views on authority, freedom, religion, and even feminism. So again, hear why, then Pilgrim's Progress, my personal favorite, okay? Um, C.H. Uh, Spurgeon's personal favorite, which, real quick side note, when I was in Brazil, the translator for me, right after get done preaching, the translator said, hey, has anybody ever told you that you look like C.H. Spurgeon? And I said, you mean preach like C.H. Spurgeon? He's like, no, look like C.H. Spurgeon. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I would have much rather heard preach. But anyways, Pilgrim's Progress is his most favorite book, written only eight years after Paradise Lost. Um, its theological concepts and over 500 scripture references has influenced church and Christians for centuries, all right? Um, and then last of all, what you guys are probably most familiar with, Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. I'm really excited for Joey to be leading that one. He's actually taught six course seminars on C.S. Lewis before, so he has a lot of knowledge on only C.S., but again, that series. Um, all of those books get on sale, and listen, um, if you go the day of that particular book, we're going to have some door prizes as well. You'll see some of them in the back, including uh, this book. It's kind of like a, a, a family version, kid version of The Pilgrim's Progress. Mark Dever has shared one of his most favorite books. We're going to hand out some door prizes, some artwork that has been influenced from some of those books as well. So again, hope for you to be able to sign up for that or just attend it. It's going to start the first Thursday after Easter and each following Thursday. Um, last of all, uh, or to... Final things, GCC 101, um, it's kind of next steps to get to know our church. Um, if you have been attending and you're praying, considering this to be your church family, your church home, church home, your community, like what Joey was talking about, we'd love for you to hear exactly what we believe, doctrine, mission, vision, get to meet our staff. There is child care available for that. Just let us know so we can make sure we have the uh, amount of workers that we need. Um, again, that's next Sunday, 5 to 7 p.m. It is also for about 60, 70 percent, we'll go just to hear more about our church, but it is next steps for membership as well. And so maybe you've been here for a few years, but you want to take steps toward membership. We share with you the process of that, and that is the first step with that as well. So if you can be able to sign up for that, again, these cards that are right in front of you. Just grab one of those cards and uh, put it in the box. I uh, want to sign up for GCC 101. Hand it to me or put it in the offering boxes that's uh, right next to those exits. Last of all, I want you to save the date. Registration will be coming out in the next few weeks. But our Vacation Bible School, which for a church that's more than half young families, but then beyond that, even if you don't fit in that category, it's our mission trip. It is our mission trip from training to how we want to reach our neighborhood. And so almost half our church help and volunteer for that. 
because of need and because of the visitors that we get. So the dates for that is June 21st to 23rd. Um, it is a Wednesday through Friday. Uh, we're trying that out this year. Uh, in the past, it was Monday through Wednesday. We're going to do Wednesday through Friday. And so we want you to save the date. We will have registration open. Uh, we know some people already signed up for volunteers. Um, we'll have that open, but then also uh, uh, registration for your own kids and inviting others. That'll come in the next few weeks. But just make sure to save that date, June 21st to June 23rd. All right. That was a lot. And I know me being from the north talking fast, it feels like it goes quicker, but maybe not. Um, let me read and send you out with our benediction. It comes from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 14, as he ends that letter um, and sends them out. Let me send you out with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we learned about in the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The community we get, we receive that grace that Joey talked about, let that be with you as you partake in community this week, as you go out and gospel one another um, uh, over this week, okay? Love you guys. See you guys next week.